So we're here today to learn about our Black Muslim brothers and sisters' experiences, their mental health and well-being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, O mankind, we have created you male and female and appointed you races and tribes that you may know one another. Surely the noblest among you in the sight of Allah is the most God-fearing of you. Allah is all-knowing and all-aware. As Muslims, we're composed of diverse languages, experiences, cultures, but we all have the same goal, which is the pleasure of Allah. As we know, February is Black History Month, and it should be of interest to every Muslim, especially in America. It is a liberal estimate that at least 20% of the Africans enslaved in the Americas were Muslim, and in some areas up to 40%. Islam in America as it stands today would not be the way it is without African American influence. As Muslims, our story in this country didn't begin with the coming of immigrants, but with the lives of the courageous African American slaves whose blood, sweat, and tears were instrumental in building this country. Their struggle is our struggle. To this day, about a third of Muslims in America identify as Black, and more than 50% of people in Africa are Muslim. Black Muslims established Islam in America, and without them, we wouldn't see and experience Islam in America as we do today. So inshallah, this Black History Month, we want to listen, we want to learn about our Black Muslim brothers and sisters, their history, their experiences, and how to support their mental health and well-being. So these are our objectives today. Um, the first half of the conversation is going to be learning about the Black Muslim experience in America. And then the second half of the conversation is going to be about the solutions to attain wellness, inshallah. And with the agenda for the first half, we're going to discuss the history of Islam in America, and we're also going to discuss the unique pains of the Black Muslim community. And inshallah, in the second half, we're going to offer solutions both for the Black Muslim community and the rest of the community to support our Black Muslim brothers and sisters, inshallah. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sister Tiffany Jones, who um, is actually one of our Madison therapists. She's a compassionate, conscientious, and dedicated professional with extensive knowledge of offering advice, support, rehabilitation, and guidance to clients who have experienced trauma or hardship. She has a broad-based experience in counseling, social work, and psychotherapy. She offers exemplary case management skills along with expertise in diagnosing and treating emotional disturbances, mental health disorders, and crisis interventions. She is continually looking to enhance her knowledge and further develop her skills to be a better clinician to contribute to the overall growth of the social services and mental health industry. She's also an associate clinical social worker, uh, professional with a master's in social work with, from the University of South California, and it's focused on community, organization, planning, and administration. She also has a bachelor from UC Berkeley in social welfare and minor in education and public policy. She also, mashallah, has an MBA from Pepperdine University, and she's a doctoral student right now, mashallah, and she's giving us her time um, in social work. And we also have with us our wonderful Dr. Zakia Hyatt, who um, this is her second time joining us. She was in our healing circle last month. She's a psychologist consultant advocate, and she provides interactive sessions for clients, children, adolescents, and adults. She focuses on center approach in both Islamic and Western culture and around any type of relationship concern that needs to be addressed. She believes that clients can expect greater success when they are serious about working in their life issues. So without further ado, um, we are looking forward to your discussion. Thank you so much for being here with us, Dr. Zakia and Sister Tiffany. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I'd like to begin with Al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, maliki yomidin. Iyaka nabudu wa iyaka nasta'in. Iddina sirata mustaqeen. Sirata ladina inamta alayhim. Bayra mu'dubi alayhim wa lakdalim. Ameen. I'd like to begin my topic area uh, specifically on point to the, to the historical um, landscape <clears throat> of, of uh, Black Muslims 
in America, both male and female. So I'm hoping that we can get a clearer understanding of what took place in the past and tie it into current time. So Black History Month for many Black Muslims in America didn't just begin at the ship or landing on the plantation. It began um, with the Muslims and non-Muslims making that dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a salvation to come. Even though they may not have experienced the salvation at that particular time of suffering, that do I sort of passed on and they believe, they believe these, you know, the black Muslims at that particular time believe that that awakening time in the 60s and the 70s were the times where they became aware and they made their shahada to make change in society. Now, change came at a price. It wasn't easy. Now, we're looking at change at the point viewpoint of the Midwest, the East Coast and the South. Now, the South wasn't the, the South that we see today. The South was the, the Bible Belt. So with that, Muslims suffered. And, um, but even though through suffering, their goal was to break the, the chains of slavery off of their head, off of their minds. Yes, there was some psychological damage and emotional sl sl um, effects due to what, to their experiences in their neighborhood. First of all, I'd like to thank Allah for the opportunity to share this information because it is something that is long overdue. It has been pushed under the rug and ignored. But today, inshallah, I'm hoping to un unfold many realities of that particular time so that we could see causation to where we are today. So one uh, area of their concern is that Muslims, the black Muslims at that particular time, would they made a pattern of reciting, there is no God but Allah, and, the, and that Muhammad, uh, uh, Muhammad was the messenger of Allah. Now, keep in mind, the Arabic wasn't that attuned to them, so they practiced and they made their prayers in English, but they rehearsed it repeatedly to themselves. And so with that, they were hoping that major change, they were very idealistic, but they were hoping that change would occur. So, and some of the things that they were hoping for would be to change society's outlook on black America. And, uh, but over time, um, conditions began to worsen for black Muslims, particularly uh, in, in, their, in the areas of which they lived. Uh, the changes in society came about where there was a movement from, the, from Europe to America regarding the nuclear family style. They wanted, the society wanted change. They wanted change in their neighborhood. And they wanted black Muslims to, you know, to stop educating the public to become aware of the problem areas of society. So here we are, they're facing the reconstruction of themselves and yet the reconstruction of society that's taking place against what they want. So some of the things that happened at that time um, in their housing complex is that they were given an option to be a part of the nuclear family and reconstruct. So they introduced the idea of housing, but the condition of that is that the women had to be housed let's say, had to agree to be housed without their with their children, but not the fathers. Another condition of that lifestyle is that they had to subject themselves to uh, invasion, home invasion on an un, uh, unannounced time. So which meant that the social worker of the mental health industry would come unexpectedly, search underneath the beds, um, look into the refrigerator, look into the closets, and and spy uh, to see if male presence was were there. They had to hide the telephones with their neighbors to avoid conversation. Quite often, the women would um, force the children, if not whip their children, to make sure they would not that they would lie. They would not be honest when white social workers would come to the home and interrogate them regarding male presence. So 
um, this continued over time where social workers would not only show up during the daytime, but also unexpectedly at night. Now, two Muslim black, two black Muslim women decided to do something opposite. And that was to address the social workers' mental health interrogation to confront the government regarding the uh, lack of re rights and respect for its citizens. Um, and so that was, that too was met with some adversities. They also appealed to the judges to um, allow them to change their names from what they describe the slave owner's name to names that they have chosen in Arabic. With organized complexities, uh, corporate, the corporate organizations flooded their community with drugs and, and um, disparity, displaced the men, um, and there was an increase, a noticeable increase of depression, um, paranoia, fear, low self-esteem, drug addiction, poor diets because there was not enough um, adequate food in the neighborhood. They also witnessed tar and feathering and burning of other black Muslims at that time, be it women, be it children. They also witnessed um, uh, the rapes. They witnessed the lynching and dismembering of other Muslim members of the families or within the neighborhood. Many things occurred in that time. And um, so I just wanted to just give you that kind of outlook of where they stood in terms of their beliefs that the system was out against them and not in favor of their movement. So that's pretty much what I have to say. Yeah. Thanks, um, Dr. Sakia. So I, I just want to also, um, I would say piggyback off of what Dr. Sakia was saying, that uh, according to scholars, 30% uh, of slaves, Muslim slaves came from Central and West Africa. Mm -hmm. And those individuals lost several things in that transition, um, which caused trauma, violence um, during um, slavery, robbing themselves of their language, um, their religious traditions, and their culture. And all of that trauma end up um, showing up now in their children's, their offsprings. Um, according to some statistics, uh, for instance, uh, suicide attempts around among black youth increased 73% between 1991 to, nine, to 2017. Um, major depression increased um, to 14% between 2015 to 2018. And now they're talking about among those individuals, they're seeing different kind of symptoms showing, manifesting. Um, and we, we look at it through society and we, as parents or uh, friends, we try to normalize these events, um, saying that, these are normal things that happen, but we uh, forget to see that most of these things stem from abuse, neglect, weakness and violence in their community, in their home, and they're now showing up. So how do we address these and how do we talk about these with, our, with individuals, with our black Muslims? How do we support everyone? So we can talk about that. Okay, thank you. Um, some of the things that uh, <clears throat> I'd like to add to the forum is when Black Muslims attempted to organize their own educational system, um, that didn't go so well, you know, because they, they attempted that, but then also they didn't, you know, there was an, an economic shortage of books. And uh, they also made attempts to go into immigrant communities to, to seek educational support. Some were able to succeed and some were not. There were also Muslims, black Muslims who weren't as 
economically deprived, but were able to navigate a little bit more effectively in society. And they started, uh, they went into public school, were pretty much successful at some of their efforts. However, things began to show up. Particularly, my topic will, will focus on the overdiagnosing of the population of Black children, particularly boys, at that time in public school sector. I have on record that um, <clears throat> Black psychologists um, and the, let me see here, Black psychologists by the name of Robert L. Williams in 1976 was, he was the first along with Dr. Francis Sally Sum Sumner in the 1920s and the 1950s to identify the disparity and racism that was directed at black children, um, Muslim black children at that time and black children in general. Um, it opened the door to a lawsuit that was made against uh, the United States government, and it was called Brown versus um, Board of Education. That occurred at a time when they said, when they had implied that this was an implication that was made that black that um, Muslim black children or black children in general were at risk of education, were at risk of proper care by their parents, and that there was a need for moral training. Now, granted, they had family. There existed, ex there existed during that time, the extended family. But that wasn't important for them because the school district at that time and that their area claimed it was not enough. So with the presidency of Obama, as it Obama, Obama, he came, uh, he passed a law for the NCLB, which was no kid left, no child left behind in 2001, that affected the, the, the what con Congress had um, enacted, which was the public law of 94-142. Now, when you have all of these systems focusing on black children and placing them in special education, they're not well tested, they're not well assessed, the teachers are not familiar with um, all the nuance about black culture and et cetera, et cetera, problems occur. And some of the problems that we've seen over time in my testing of children is that once the teachers ignite or inform the school psychologists or the psychologists outside, that there is a problem, there is a problem with the child. They alert the parents and identify that the child is not functioning at grade level. Now, there could be a discrepancy between ability or, 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 a, or a style of learning. However, that discrepancy exists, or it could be a behavior problem. So a, batter, a list of battery assessments are made. As I mentioned before, there is a meeting with the staff, of the, of the school, they obtain data from them. There is a diagnosis that is obtained for the sake of the insurance companies. And there is the IEP or the 504 plan enact. And also they review the cumulative file. Now granted, if the schools were not up to date with files, particularly some of the Islamic schools and some of the regular schools, there's going to be missing information. So assessors, you know, be it school psychologists, the program specialists, teachers, they're going to miss this information. However, it didn't stop the process of the labeling and the referral for special ed. And we have seen that over time, since the early 40s, that, the, that Muslims' children um, and also Racism was the underlining area of, of uh, report writing, a lack of understanding about the child in general, and a lack of understanding about the historical child in general. Um, so in addition to what we've said before, when you look at trauma, and trauma existed in the community, 
it had a role to play with these children. However, it was never recognized as a concerning item in the reports of the psychologist and the school. That get, the goal was to label the child as special ed. And it was successfully done um, by the school. Now, these, one of the, you know, you can use any instrument to determine the, um, the ability of the child. But one of those, and I just sort of sketched this out here so we could see it, that bell curve there is a unique feature that was used back in the, in the 1940s. <laughs> Excuse me. In the 1940s. Now, with the bell curve, you have the midpoint here at the top of the, of the line here, which is, it is called the distribution, the norm of distribution. So when you're in the middle of that, that bell curve, that bell curve creates the norm. Either if, it's to, if, the, if the scores indicate more to the left, then that means that that child is in trouble. If the scores lean more to the right, then that is a functional child. But if the assessor is biased, has already a, a bias toward the child, and the child has an anxiety, a child has been traumatized, and the child is not uh, uh, familiar with the tester or the assessor, then the, that will influence the outcome of that bell curve. But again, what goes notice is the report and the assessment of those people within the school district. And henceforth, that child will be moved automatically into special ed, which is not equipped to deal with that child. In most cases, the child will sit uneducated for months and months on. <clears throat> so if, uh, Tiffany, if you'd like to add a little bit to it or on testing and assessments from another angle, it, you could. So um, another, I would say, unique pain and grief that um, Muslim experiences, depression and anxiety. And um, according to some scholars, um, our, our own Jacob experienced the same thing. He said, um, Jacob, when cried out to our Lord, I have been touched with adversity and you are the most merciful of the merciful. So we, we talk about having experienced diversity in our lives and our, our scholars talk about it as well. So it does exist. Most of us tend to um, put down depression, anxiety um, among our people and don't seek treatments for, for, for these symptoms. One thing that, um, that I, I see in most of my talks um, with my clients is that they don't seek therapy or they don't talk about it until it's too late. And for us to, to start talking about it um, among ourselves or family, we need to be educated on how it looks um, what, and, and not just wait for a therapist to tell you this is how um, what's going on with you. Because most of the time we see that we get diagnosed for certain things, mostly based on our skin color. Um, one thing that, though, that I've seen in the past is we get that um, explosive disorder. It's just because they see us as an angry person and nothing else. And so we have to get more educated on how these symptoms manifest, how we can take control over it um, before we end up getting prescribed um, medication. As uh, Dr. Sakia says, uh, we are always um, over medicated. So let, let's see how we can work on getting different um, techniques and tools to support ourselves as Muslims. So um, I mentioned earlier, were you, I'm sorry, did I? You're good. Okay, good. Okay, I mentioned earlier that there were two women, two Muslim women uh, who were very instrumental in the uh, awakening period of that, of that era. Um, basically, some of the things that, um, that they did was to educate 
residents. I mean, they had all kinds of uh, classes to educate about landlord-tenant awareness, about cleanliness, about school rights, about children's rights. And it made an impact when it came to attending um, um, a child who was diagnosed with a learning disability or ADHD or ADD or somewhere on that spectrum of autism was not on the spectrum for for uh, um, Muslim <clears throat> black children at that particular time until the the advent of drug addiction. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. And so what happened through that period, that long period of education was insightful. They became empowered. Changes were being made. And guess what? Government intervened. They set up new regulations. So the programs had to end because it was no longer funded. Even though they were, they were aware of the process, but they were not um, allowed to continue the process. So here we're talking about a system where the, the mother was, was made every attempt to be an advocate for her child. The extended family participated in that process. However, again, the programs were shut down because they didn't want that kind of awareness to exist. <clears throat> that leads me on to anxiety. Now, anxiety was coupled with all of this. I mean, imagine a kid living in this, in this environment and they, what they're seeing constantly. And it's not like the average person living in the suburbs when they get off the bus or they get someone to pick them up from school, they're able to go home and see dogs, cats, children playing. I mean, it's a wholesome environment. And uh, they, they may see or hear something pleasant in the neighborhood. But for these children, they heard cars running down the street, running into houses, gunshots, you know, people screaming, people being thrown from the projects, tall high rises, thrown from the buildings, or having to travel up the elevator and seeing all kinds of whatever, you know, urine, feces or whatever within the elevator. So you're going into the system and you're looking at the substandard living condition that you're faced with every day. And, you know, so this is an added stress. This is an added anxiety for children. But what happened is that the Black Muslims of America decided to arm themselves because even though they, the, the awareness schools had shut down, they managed to meet in their homes. I mean, that showed resilience. They managed to meet in the park. They managed to meet in community centers in order to continue fighting for the rights, their rights and the rights of their children. They noticed and they identified some things that had been, had been um, um, uh, placed within the, the records of the child anxiety, stress that related to child's ability to learn. <clears throat> and we can see that some of the things that they did was apply to make every attempt to apply Islam and some aspect of Islam, the Quran and the Hadith to help their child. So they came up with meal times. And so they had people who said, well, we can provide meals for the daycare or we can pr provide meals for the schools. And they would drop off these meals for the children so they would have an adequate diet. So that became an active forum for them in order to reduce uh, a lot of um, the anxiety and stress for, in children's lives. Some were effective and so were not. Um, they reminded them, parents reminded their children when, they're, when they get home to make the salat. So if they were anxious, they weren't anxious at home. If they, were, if they had worries, they weren't worried that much at home, at least not noticed. Because at that particular time, we have to keep in mind that there was a, an, an, a, a vernacular known item that was said among the elders that what you hear and what you see, you stay quiet. In other words, zip your lip. 
You don't say anything about it for fear that harm would be would come to the family or to the child. Now, that was something that was stemming from slavery, and also it became a carryover into the, their day-to-day lives. And why does it continue to exist? Because the elders have held themselves true to this, and some of the younger people incorporated the same principle, is that the secret exists with them until the grave. In other words, I should say it goes in the grave with them. So they ignore the realities of problems that were pretty obviously, that they were obviously faced with, whether it was sleep disorder or, or, or acting out in the classrooms or in the home setting. They ignored these things because they said, if you ignore it, it'll go away. So some of the practices they use when they saw, um, <clears throat> um, let's say their children that were a- anxious or for themselves, music and drumming, um, plenty of outside food and entertainment that calmed them down. And thinking about pleasant things and not worrying about the the, um, adversities that were occurring in the neighborhood. So those were some of the things that they uh, attempted to apply to the best of their ability, not ignoring the realities that as this child is growing up, things may not be the same. I know um, we we can talk about how we address these issues and how to, how we address these pains. And um, one thing that we do have to learn and know is like, according to uh, David Williams um, from the National Institute on Health, he states that 23% of black report every single day discrimination that builds up into trauma that causes people to have little ability to make decisions to respond to stress um, attention and society sees that as ADHD as um, anxiety as something else and we fail to see that Although we have these things going on in our everyday, we are also very resilient and we know how to to support ourselves, how to manage our own emotions, how to behave around individuals. When we open up and talk about all of these trauma that we have to let's say somebody that is outside of our religion outside of our culture they first have to add a label to it so let's see how we can open to another muslim another african-american somebody that knows our culture knows where we come from and see how that individual can support us to become more resilient so again it starts with us having open communication and open feelings our males for sure for one thing, they are built to not show that much emotion. They are built to to be that tough person. And so we have to open that wall and show them that, no, you can be open with us. You can start talking to us, start um, communicating, because that's where we learn what's going on and how we can support you. So again, and this is one thing that uh, Dr. Sakia talks about, that extended family. When um, students go away to college, they cut off that family, but we need to learn how to keep them with us, how to communicate what's going on and how they are able to address those issues that come up. And also, (laughs) as as we talked about, how do we create that... um, Muslim community where we create wellness. That's something that we have to work on to be at peace when people talk about their personal life and their personal experience and not be um, as judgmental as our our society is. Um, I'd like to add to that is that when we talk about the black Muslim 
um, history, and I'm just going to tie this in together, is that when they were in fight or flight, not everyone remained in the United States. Some left to go to Saudi Arabia. Some went to Apicu, New Mexico to live because Saudi had purchased land there. Some went to the South and lived among a place called Al Medina. So, and some just generally left, period. They took their family, picked up and left. Some went to the West Coast in order to live, to maintain some sort of sense. Those who left to the Middle East and other countries came back. And what they came back with was hope. And so some of the things that they saw and they ed started educating people about. Now, again, this is the government had changed. There were people had settled into the nuclear family construct. Kids were already messed up. Parents were already messed up. They were single head of household. Men had left the home. Drug addiction was all over the place. Prostitution and pimping was, was just prevalent. It was a hot mess. So when they came and began to interact with people in those, in those areas, they started an educational program. And with that, here comes the ideal environment. So some of the things that they talked about, okay, well, if we're, if we're, as social workers, we're still invading their homes and still putting pressure on them. If they didn't comply, they would lose their funding. <clears throat> and so basically they said this, according to Islam, now they're, the application of, of Islam is beginning to take place in a desperate situation. The basic principles under, as they quoted, the basic principles under client therapy relationship, be it school or off school setting, because they saw the need that mental health was needed at this point, is to get to know, is for the therapist is to get to know the client's background, get be more familiar. So they became an advocate for mom and her child. They went there, they had these organizations and they went with them with this kind of language. They said the effects of wellness process <clears throat> serves as a strength and bond between therapist and client relationship. Each therapist, um, uh, each ther therapist should base their, even though their skills may be different in ability and approach, the key factor in dealing with a Muslim, a Muslim is different than dealing with a non-Muslim because they're not coming from the same criteria. So they try to push the envelope to say, you need to study more about Allah and the Quran and, the, and things like that to educate the, the, the school system. And did it work? We'll talk about it later. They tried to educate the social worker. I mean, it came to a point the social worker refused to come because they would stand in the, in the doorway to ask and interrogate the social worker. So the social worker ultimately gave up. But basically, what they did was encourage new values, encourage strength to make change in light of the adversities that people were experiencing at that particular time. And that was welcomed. You like that? So, so let, let's, let's move on to how do we create this wellness around us? How do we create a community where we're safe to address mental health, to address the trauma that we've been through. How do we do that without getting labels, um, getting stigmas? How do we are able to open up without people saying, well, you need medication. You need this to, to get through that. Or, oh my gosh, I can't believe you went through that. And then move on. Let, let's see how we can sit in the conversation and make sure that when you walk away from that conversation, that person felt that they were heard, mm -hmm. that they were understood for what they're going through and know that there's someone else out there who understood them and is able to support them on their journey. So I, I know uh, Dr. Sakia talked about uh, something that Clara mastered and how they explore that um, Medina period. You wanna elaborate on that? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So one of the things that the, um, 
uh, the, the this was this is something that happened on the West Coast. And as I mentioned, when you're bringing immigrants to the West Coast, when you're bringing those Muslims that those the black Muslims that were there in the critical time of life. Now, granted, they were they seem to be more functional because they grew up outside of the area. So they weren't affected by the same pressures and racism and bigotry and labeling that the ones who stayed behind. So here they are. They ended up, some of them ended up in on the West Coast. So let's look at this prototype between the 1980s to 2010. This prototype was different. Unlike the ones that you may see in different locations throughout the United States where black Muslims exist, where they are across the other states, you see the line of demarcation. You see the masjid of the black Muslims, the masjid of the Bosnian, the masjid of the Arabs and the masjids of the Indo-Pakistanis, all divided. But what we have seen, what we did, we had people travel and they brought back this kind of wisdom. Why don't we create a new prototype? So here we are in California and we're looking at what was brought to us. And we look more specifically at why don't we, since, since the environment is already diverse, you had Yemenis, you had people from Palestine, you had Indian and Pakistanis from very rich, very reason you had Asians, you had the, you had every walk of life in California. And some of the things that they did, we as a women folk meeting together for a weekly halakha intervention. This is a go-to. Meet weekly for and the men did the same thing to upgrade their skills. Secondly they did is they started an Islamic school. Very based, started with the little kids and they took part in the education and formation of the minds. So people didn't mind going to the small Islamic educational school. Now, again, we're talking about a, an international community as that new prototype. From that, this took about, let's say, an estimated of 15 to 20, year, of a, well, 20 years um, of a span of time. But the motivation was there behind the women and Muslim men that were there. And again, it was not a matter of the black Muslim, it was a matter of international behavior. So the education was one, the ongoing halakhas, and then they started planning socials, and the socials may entail outside socials of the home, going camping, and having some parties at the homes, to generate social ability and mannerisms. Um, they brought their families from overseas and guess what? Then the um, black Muslims said, okay, I'm gonna bring my family, bring my parents to visit. And so there was, there was an overlapping and also the copying and they saw positive results. People began to interact, visit each other. People began to experience these were like non-Muslims and Muslims began to visit international homes and, and uh, sat with them and ate and had good social times together. So they had mentorships for the children. They had big celebrations, especially during Ramadan and Eid. They would decorate the homes, decorate outside, and also incorporate some of what is done here, get the kids all dressed up, and then they go to the masjid. The masjid became a flavored place to be. There was also social activity there. So it became contagious. <clears throat> they, had, they started a charity group where they began to cook. We had... There were women who were just this massive cooking skills. And they would, would take foods to homes of Muslims in the community who needed food, clothing. And the mass just got involved in that as well. They were also involved in making sure that the men who were unemployed become employed. So they created these jobs because they opened up supermarkets. They opened up all kinds of marketplaces. The place was flooded with marketplaces. Or if it were in engineering, they would help that and support that person. Or if they were in prison and they were being paroled, they had a, a, um, a parole setting 
uh, for the ex-offenders and they would come out and get uh, help them and assist them in acclimating to the society. Some, even, some women even married based on those conditions and they shipped them out to their country to get social, more social ability. A lot of these, the more socials added up where they started organizing dress up parties, weddings that were elaborate, but who did it? It was the community that organized these settings because the end goal was to decrease divorce, increase marriages. And excessive um, volunteer work, um, and I mentioned the donations, and um, bringing, you know, visiting, visiting the sick, also visiting various places of conferences and meeting with different people, sharing their ideologies and not being afraid to speak out. This was the proto prototype. So it increased the bond between the, the Muslims, uh, the immigrant Muslims to, the, to, the, to those uh, black Muslims and white Muslims and as such. So it became a positive uh, prototype for resources, problem solving, and communication. It was a good time. Thank you so much. Sister Tiffany, do you mind um, ending us with just a little bit of a summary of what the Black community can do to attain wellness and then a call to action for the rest of the community to provide these safe spaces? So um, one thing that I would say is that we have to start with our young children. We have to start with educating them on how to be um, able to explore and talk about how they're feeling. Um, there, there's a saying that says that a research, I think it is, one in every three black children have been exposed to at least two to eight adverse childhood experiences. And with that being said, how do we work with them so that they know that those are not normal experience in everyone's life? We can't say that for our counterparts, um, Black, Asian. We can never have those statistics. But it's the community that we live in that, we're, that, that we keep seeing children come out of, and we're not supporting them. How much of those um, individuals that their school have a nurse on site, a psychiatrist, a, um, a psychologist, or even a social worker that they can walk into every single day and talk to. So we, as parents, adults, we need to start advocating for those little things in the school. We need to start having those um, tangible things being accessible to everyone. We can create it in our community, in, in our masjid. Can we have a psychiatrist on hand, someone who is able to see someone at the drop of a dime, or have a phone call with a 24-hour service where it's just for emotional support? Most people, although they have that close family, that close friend, they want something that's not biased. Because, you know, when you go to your girlfriend, they're going to be like, oh, let's get the person. But you yeah. want some someone who's be will be more objective and and give you something that's based on your belief, on your religion, on how life's supposed to be. And so we have to start working on having a safe space created in our masjid, in our homes, in our school. And let's let's see how us as a black Muslim can start creating that, having that dialogue on where we can create that safe space. So I'll, I'll end it with that. I'd like to add something to that <clears throat> for the for the for Black Muslim uh, families of the nuclear family style who managed to isolate themselves from the extended family. A, a good thread that we could share as a healer is to find a common thread of com toward communication without penalty, without punishment, without bringing up at the onset of a visit those negatives, but focus on other aspects of building positive relationships first. Build that bond, 
and continue the communication, continue working with the extended family because we don't know if they have felt what you have felt, but at least start on the onset as communication, with communication. Zakamal Khairan, um, we really appreciate your time. We're going to move to the Q&A soon. We do have some questions already um, in the chat in the Q&A box. Um, we will have some links posted in the chat with some additional resources and toolkits that some organizations have put together. Um, that way the conversation doesn't end now. It's more of an opener so that we can, inshallah, um, do our work afterwards. So um, Sister Zahra will post those in the chat. Um, she also posted a feedback form. Um, we would like to always improve our programming. So if you can take about two minutes to do that um, at some point today. And also um, Dr. Zakia and Sister Tiffany both offer um, therapy services uh, and information about that will also be posted in the chat in case anybody um, felt, feels the need to, you know, to do some counseling, inshallah, afterwards. So I will go ahead and share some of those questions. Um, I will actually begin with some comments that were in the chat in case you missed them. Uh, somebody mentioned most of the time you don't know how to express your feelings. I know, Sister Tiffany, you were talking a little bit about um, that being a barrier. So if you want to elaborate on what are ways we can express our feelings in a healthy way. So um, I know... Most people, when they get uncomfortable and or there's something very emotional that comes up, they tend to laugh it off or um, or say, "I'll talk about it another time." Um, for us, we need to sit in that conversation and ask the question again, um, and let them know that it is safe to cry, it is safe to say anything. To me, because everything that you talk about is just between both of us, and and let them know if, if this is the time for you to cry, let's do it. Let let's get out that feeling. Um, that's how we we start working on what's the deep root of the, the 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 emotion that you're going through right now. So start start talking with just how are you doing today, and and wait for them to answer that question. And then just the not in, it's okay. There, there's a, a little thing that I have on my board that says, when somebody says it's okay, there's something going on deeper than that. When somebody smiles and say, oh my God, I had a good day. You know, they really had a good day. But it's, it's those little sights that you hear in their voice or you see in their face. Make sure you are very attentive. So when they say certain things, you can address it right away. Thank you so much, Sister Tiffany. Um, Dr. Zakia, I think this question would be appropriate for you because you were talking about the special ed and the school systems. Um, the sister said, I have a friend from Ethiopia whose three-year-old daughter is being labeled as autistic and her mom is being pressured to send her to a special ed school. What resources could she use to fight back against this labeling? Well, one of the resources that's available to her is a book that is published for special ed and it is for parents so it's written by um, um a, a man by the name of lights w-r-i-g-h-t peter w d Wright. and uh this is and i'll just show this right here this is a great resource guide Okay, and having a resource guide and you're sitting together with other women and just other families just and in discussion, this is an empowered book. So the more we know about the rights of ourselves as parents to the right of your child, you become the best advocate. I have seen at many IEPs and 504 meetings regarding children, a whole team of families show up because if you're going along, it's 
it's it's you feel intimidated by the by the jargon, by the language that you're unfamiliar. If there is a language barrier, you can request an interpreter. So these are some of the rights that, that are available uh, to you. If you or your children um, uh, feel that, it, you're, that the assessment was not up to par, that there may have been some bias, have review it, look through the book to see what areas that you can use to apply to those areas of concern. It's an easy reader for any, at a parent level, and I think you'll understand it and use it. I know one, um, my, my son start moving around because I moved a lot when I was doing schooling and my son is the only child. So his resilience, he makes friends easily. He is very vocal with getting to know individuals. The school he moved into, again, um, it, because of the high level that the school is in, we moved him into that school district. They're not used to kids who are that functional, that, that's so um, attached to making friends and, and vocal. And the first thing, the first few days in, um, I would say about a week, so there, I got an a email saying, um, we, we think we need to do an assessment on your son for ADHD. Uh, uh, my first thing was, that's his resilience showing up. After the first two weeks of him making friends, you will see the difference. Don't do anything without my consent. Two weeks, three weeks later, not a single word. So you got to stand up for your child. You, got, you know how your child is at home. You know, that's the setting that they're comfortable with. They won't change going to a school. They will have that same reaction at school. So let them be aware of it on the first few days. Because some of them come in, some of the teachers come in with, they want a perfect setting. But that's not how students are. And there are times when teachers want a quiet room. Mm -hmm. And they want this kid to be quiet. So they're going to make, they're the, they're the first to raise their hand to say, medicate. Because I don't want to do the work. And I think this kid needs to be quiet so I can have a quiet room. So, you know, so sometimes it takes finding a teacher of match. And skills that is able, that, that's, that's in tune to your child's need. And you have the right to switch classrooms. You have that right. And if the school does not, is not able to match your need and you've done all the assessments or if you haven't done the assessment, there is always another school or other teachers. So you do have an option. You don't have to settle for one teacher. Yeah, yep. They also have um, um, teacher's aid. If, if your uh, classroom doesn't have a teacher's aid, request one. Because that means that the teacher gets that extra support for the, the students then. And sometimes they're put down because the parents are not stepping in asking for the, the resource. If, you're, if your student needs an extra support, you step in and make sure that you're vocal with the principal there. Let them know that that classroom needs a, a teacher aid. Get it done. Yes. In addition to um, requesting a student study team meeting, whereby you're able to bring in <clears throat> medical or pediatric reports, uh, the pediatrics will make an assessment to rule out whatever they're claiming or rule in to the claim of whatever is present. So you can have your pediatrician or you can have as many people that you desire to attend the SST is what they call it, the student study team meeting, to, um, <clears throat> to reveal the content of concern so that you can best advocate for your child in a learning setting. And always get a copy. Always get copies. You never walk out of there with a signature and they have the copies. You're entitled to a copy of the CUME file and you're entitled to the signature page. So that's your right. 
Um, there was a similar question. I think, I, I don't know if you want to supplement it, but I think the answer would probably be similar. It says, can you speak to options available to parents to exit their children out of special ed, especially when special ed referral was unnecessary clinician error bias? So I think it's very similar to the previous questions or anything you wanted to add to it. The exit process is a little different. You can't just arbitrarily pull out. So it's a due process, as they call it. It's called due process. And so the due process is that SST that I just mentioned. That's the starting point. And then the parent writes a letter to the school, principal, administrator, and the teacher, um, mainly the administrative people, that you are requesting this exit by such and such a time. So you would bring, so that, uh, in doing so, the they will bring the team to the table along with the resource specialist to listen to your concern and to make sure teachers' reports are all aligned and you've done all your interventions like um, remedial uh, reading or you know someone you've hired to, to confirm that those scores, that your attempts, your scores are current and above the performance of the school. So it's not just, I feel that I need to remove, it is a due process. And the reason why, if something happens in the academic world by making that move away from where they are, they may be held liable. So, you know, they always say, cover your butt, do the re do, do your, bring your proof to claim the exit. And it is a due process of exiting because all signatures, again, are necessary for the exit, exiting process. Now, even though you exit, you can leave a clause that in case something happens in the future, you have, you can re-enter. Inshallah. Um, there was a follow-up, Sister Tiffany, to your answer about um, emotions. The question, it was in the chat, what about if the person that triggered or caused the trauma doesn't want to hear or allow you to express yourself? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time for me? Yeah, um, it says in the chat, what, so you were talking about emotions and importance of expressing ourselves and our feelings. Um, so the response was, what if the person that triggered or caused the trauma doesn't want to hear or allow you to express yourself? I, you know what, I've had that question several times um, from, from just clients talking about it. Um, one thing that I always talk about, there's different ways for you to um, express what happened to you to maybe that individual. For instance, um, sexual abuse, or um, I would say um, domestic violence. It's very hard for you to talk to that individual about what they've done to you, um, especially when it's one on one in person and that person doesn't want to hear it because they really don't believe that they've harmed you in any way at all. So you can do this in two different ways. One, write a letter. It takes so much for you to write down how you feel and leave it for that individual so that they, one, can read and have the option to not respond or have the option to respond because you don't want to be the aggressor when you come to, when you come to talking to someone they might feel feel that you're being aggressive with them so write a letter another one um, that you can do is start um, journaling it helps when you journal how you feel your past experience and, and take note of how, how you're moving on over that. And possibly if you still want to confront that individual about what, what they've done to you, you can pass a journal to them and tell them it's, it's on them if, if they want to talk about it after they finish reading. But this is how it's affected you in your life. And they don't need to talk to you, but this is how you want them to know how you feel right now. I'd like to ask, add to that, if I may. Um, prayer is a very powerful tool. And sometimes when we're 
we're limited to a conversation or the right, the use of the right word in the right setting, or we may feel shy about our approach. We can take that to prayer. Prayer is a powerful source and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you. I mean, just talk to Allah like you're talking to some it's like a person in front of you. And just ask Allah to give you the tools, the time, the words to be able to bring this out to this person in the most effective way so that it's understood rather than being misunderstood. And just just take that and 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 you know, over time. You know, you'll you'll get that strength over time. That opportunity, inshallah, will open up where you where you're able to to express that thought in a realistic way, inshallah. So we have another question. What can we do to support our adolescent other than medication? Oh wow, there's there's so much tools uh, to work with. Um, First of all, I always talk about meditation, um, changing someone's diet, um, even working with different um, counseling, um, expressive art, especially when it, when it comes to adolescents, um, how, how to use their time effectively. Um, there's also culturally based healing art uh, for you to use. Um, I know, for instance, I, I also have, um, I use, a, you say, animal therapy. I, I bought a puppy for my dog. That takes up a lot of his time. <laughs> um, but it's always about that self-care. How do you have your adolescent move from different um, transition during the day? From school, back to home, doing chores, homework. Um, even, even in college, this applies to them. From getting up in the morning, what do you do? Do you pray? Then go to class, um, maybe have your side job, study. But in that full day, where is the self-care happening? Where do you add that in to make sure that you're taking that time for yourself? How are you med med um, doing meditation? How are you exercising to keep healthy? What did you eat? Keep a journal of, of how your diet is. Because little things that change in your day actually adds up over time and it affects you so keep a journal of, of how your day went so that when something happened you can go back and see what's going on but there's so much ways for you to change how someone um, moves from medication and i always say start with meditation start with changing your diet your exercise and your routine for the day and see how it helps and i don't want to say just get off medication and please make sure if you're on meds Check with your doctor. Make sure that they know that that's what you want to do and how to get off safely and what are the consequences. With the um, also with with adolescents, it's the it's that age of discernment. It's an age where they're they're learning right from wrong, and judgment is very important. So. In their in their in their co in their cognitive world, and as their body is going through all these physiological and emotional changes, is storytelling. There's so many stories that can relate to their age that will tie into what they're going through on an emotional level and psychological level and behavior. You tie those in. And then parents get involved in taking them to the masjid so they can meet other men or other, uh, or, you know, other females. And they have these social circles where they're learning and having the discussion because they're approaching. The goal is to get them through that time period to adult life successfully. So their concerns is very real. And let them ask questions and uh, always keep the channels of communication open with them and listen, listen to them and, and listen to some of the things that they say, which could be very functional and try not to treat them as children when we want them to be like an adult. Inshallah. And we will end with this one comment, which I'm going to turn into a question in case we do have educators on the group. Um, She's, the sister says, sometimes teachers lack these emotional intelligence and knowledge 
for not making the teaching about themselves and how they want to teach, instead having a mindset to teach and educate the child according to their potential and abilities. So maybe we can end some with some advice um, for educators or anybody who works with children and adolescents um, on how to increase, I guess, that emotional intelligence. I know um, I've always been taught that not every single person learn the same way. There's tangible. Uh, I, 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 I was um, doing math when I went to uh, Cal and doing um, studies with these students. I've always known that you touch, you feel something, you see something, you read something. They're all different senses that you're using. And not all students use these senses together. Some of them pick two of them, and that's how they learn. Uh, teachers need to figure out how to communicate with all these four senses to make sure that one of them will get through. Most of them come in with an agenda, write on the board, and that's it. They need to figure out how to move and nurture these students with all of these four senses. Um, to add to that, <clears throat> the SST spreadsheet is, some, is a useful tool for parents and teachers and administrative staff whereby you can hold teacher accountable to something that is in writing. And so when you look at the strength of the child, the weakness of the child, and you look at interventions and a timeline that these interventions need to be addressed and what they do and describe them in detail will help teacher understand specifically what the needs are. And we set up a follow-up date. So that's it. And don't spread it out too far, but make it soon where parent is involved in the Q&A. So that SST is very, very important to holding teacher accountable and parents as well. Inshallah, thank you so much, Dr. Zakia and Sister Tiffany for discussing and allowing us to learn from you today. And thank you, attendees. I do wanna share quickly um, our resources. So if you, um, are you able to see the screen? Are we good? There we go. Okay, alhamdulillah. So if you enjoyed, inshallah, this event and you don't want to have FOMO and miss any of our other events, um, you can follow us on all of our social media channels. Also, if you feel like you benefited in any way, um, please consider donating to Madistan. The donation link will be in the chat um, so that we can continue, inshallah, having these resources for our wonderful community. And inshallah, we will end with dua together. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya Allah, thank you for gathering us here this evening and allow us to always have a heart that feels for others. We thank you, Allah, for allowing us to make it here, accept our intentions to get closer to you. We ask you, Allah, to place love between all of our hearts, increase our love for you and towards your messengers and provide us the health and strength to worship you the way you like to be worshipped. Ya Allah, expand our hearts and facilitate our affairs. Have mercy on our weakness and calm our anxieties. Accept our works, rectify our affairs, and preoccupy us with our remembrance of you. Make us prefer goodness, grant us above and beyond what we hope for. O most merciful of those who show mercy, make us a source of blessing and mercy for others. Unite the hearts of everybody in this room, everyone who intended to be here, and everyone who is not here with us. Grant love, compassion, and empathy between our hearts and souls, and provide us with the strength to continually uplift each other. Ya Allah, we ask you for the humility of the humble and the companionship of the upright. We ask you for abundance in every goodness and immunity from every harm. Ya Allah, grant us a solution and a way out of every concern that troubles us and grant us provision from where we do not anticipate it. Ya Allah, grant us a resolution and a way out of our troubles. Inspire our hearts to be grateful for you in every situation. Make us aware of the value of your blessings through their ceaseless continuation. There is no strength or power except through you, the most exalted and majestic. Ya Allah, we each have personal struggles we are dealing with, and you promise with hardship there will always be ease. Remove from our hearts any fears or inhibit inhibitions, and replace them with an ever-increasing boldness to live each moment as best as we can. Ya Allah, 
Some of us are carrying personal trauma or trauma passed on from previous generations. Ya Allah, grant us strength and resilience and break the trauma from passing down to our children. Ya Allah, the burdens of life sometimes seem too heavy to bear. The anxiety and anguish that sits inside of us feels bigger at times than the world around us. Give us audacious hearts that can overcome that pain inside, hearts that help us to carry each burden with ease, regardless of how heavy it seems. Make us people who find strength through selflessness and not selfishness, and sincerity, not self-centeredness. Ya Allah, forgive us for our shortcomings and guide and bless us all. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha la ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Glory is to you, O Allah, and praise is to you. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship but you. I seek your forgiveness and repent to you. Ameen. Please don't forget that we do have resources um, for therapists on madistan.org slash resources.